so I would imagine that um, romantic comedies um, or any kind of any kind of comedy isn't, isn't necessarily a place people go for wisdom. Um, there are incredible lines from you know some of those romantic comedies, like "You Complete Me," "You Had Me at Hello." That's from the same movie. But um, I was watching this movie years ago, and uh, it's called Dan in Real Life. I don't know if you guys ever saw Dan in Real Life. It's sorry, it's Steve Carell, and so I'm a big Office fan. So anyway, Steve Carell plays this widower who has three daughters, and the oldest daughter at one point, the oldest daughter is seeing this boy, and Steve Carell does not like the idea that um, this girl is seeing this boy, and at one point he. The boy kind of follows his family to uh, on their vacation, and Steve Carell puts him in a taxi. He's like, "You got to go home." You know, he says, "You know, you're going to get over this feeling." And at one point, the young man says to Steve Carell, the dad, he says, "Love isn't a feeling; it's an ability." I remember thinking, "Oh my gosh, that's genius!" Because it's true. Love is an ability. You know, we've been talking for the last four. This is the fourth week of this series called Tough Love. And if there's anything that we've heard is that love is it's an ability. We some people you can do it. But also, there's people who can't do it because they haven't developed the ability. So what we talked about, we talked about how um, examples like uh, sometimes tough love is saying what you need to say, saying the hard things people need to hear. Sometimes tough love is allowing someone to experience the consequences of their actions. Sometimes tough love is taking on the consequences of someone else's actions and forgiving them. Sometimes love is rejecting a resentment of someone else, and it is just receiving God's love and allowing yourself to rejoice in the gifts God has given someone else. I think all those things are true, but at the core, there's something even more essential, something even deeper about tough love. I believe that tough love is the ability. I believe tough love is the power to love even when I don't want to. That, that's the, the, at the heart of tough love is, is the ability. It's the power to love even when I don't feel like it. It's, it's the ability to love regardless. That's it. Just, I can love regardless. Remember, remember this, the definition of love. Love is willing the good of the other. Imagine, imagine what it would be like to be able to love, to do that, to will the good of the other, regardless of changing circumstances or changing moods. If we're going to be like Jesus, we have to have this ability to love regardless. If we're going to be, if we're going to have the ability to love, it means that we can will the good of the other regardless of changing circumstances or changing moods. If we're going to be able to love God, we have to be able to do this, regardless of changing circumstances or changing moods. So how, question, how do you love God? I think it's kind of fascinating. Because love others, right? Willing their good. But God doesn't, God doesn't need anything. So you, how do you will God's good? Well, we don't will the good of God, really. What we do is, Jesus makes it clear. He says, if you love me, in the John's Gospel, he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. So essentially, the way we love God is by doing what he asked us to do which goes with the, the gospel today. This is remarkable. Just, we love God. We do this thing because you asked me to. That's the only reason. So in the gospel, you have this father and he has these two sons and he asks them both. And we hear the story, right? They, one says yes, one says no. One, they both change their minds. One goes even though he said no. One doesn't go even though he said yes. But the reality is if they end up in the vineyard, if either of them end up in the vineyard, they're only there for one reason. That's it. They're there for one reason alone. And that reason is because the father asked them to. Like, neither of them seem inclined to go into the vineyard on their own. If they're doing it, if they're actually in the vineyard, it is for one reason. It's just simply because the father asked them to. So that's loving God. Doing something because he asked us to. But I think it's really important to note this. Um, in, in, the, in the parable, in the gospel, one son says yes, one son says no. And this strikes me as just kind of being fascinating. It seems as if the father accepts their answers. Right? That actually, the one son says no. And the father seems to accept that. Now, note this. There is a right answer, right? The right answer is to do what the father asks. That, that's clear. It's not like, who does it? Who cares? The father's not indifferent. The father's not indifferent. But the sons are given this thing that is a requirement for love. What I mean is the sons have freedom. We have to understand that this is, so, this is so incredibly important for us. That freedom is a prerequisite for love. That in fact, not just freedom, the freedom to say no is a prerequisite for love. And I, I, we realize why. Because freedom is a precondition for any meaningful yes. The reality, of course, is that if I can't say no, then what does my yes mean? If, I, if I'm in a situation and I actually I don't have the ability to say no, then I actually don't have the ability to love. If I can't, don't have the ability to say no, then I don't really have the ability 
to say yes. I think because some of us, this might be us, and many of us, we don't know how to say no. Remember, remember, love is an ability, and part of that ability is having the freedom, having the power to say no. But we might struggle with that. I mean, some of us might struggle from what I call good kid syndrome. Like if you're a good kid, you know, just you realize that, hey, if you're a good kid and you say yes a lot, you don't ever say no, you just do what you're told, then people like you. <laughs> people in, in authority, they like you. If you're the person who, whenever someone asks you to help and you, can, you actually can't say no because you're just, uh, that's why people, the reason, you learn this pretty quickly, the reason why people like me is because I never say no. And so you might fall into this trap of the good kid syndrome where I just, I, if, I, if I say no, I will no longer be loved. But I'm not free. In those moments, am I, I'm not free to say no, therefore my yes is just kind of this default. It's a yes out of fear. Speaking of fear, how many times do we not say no out of fear of, of missing out? That we don't often say yes because, you know, if someone invites us to do something, we might not immediately say yes because we have the fear of, of missing out something else better, but we also don't necessarily say no because we have the fear of missing out on this thing that we're invited to. So oftentimes fear just drives this inability, inability to say no. Or even the fear of, of making the wrong decision. What if I shut this door and now it's, it's, maybe it's permanently closed and I don't want to lose this option and so I'm afraid of making the wrong decision so I'm afraid to say no. But here's the reality. Love is an ability. And part of that ability is being able to decide. Part of that ability is being free to decide. It's, you know, we keep saying this over the course of this whole series on tough love. Two things, we kept saying that love is a decision, right? It's a choice. And also that love always involves sacrifice. We have to realize though, the very nature of a decision is that it always involves sacrifice. Any decision involves sacrifice. In fact, the, the, <laughs> the word decide literally means to cut off. So if I'm gonna make any kind of decision, I, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm cutting off some things. I'm sacrificing some things. And so if you and I are ever going to have the ability to love and the freedom to love. We have to first have the freedom to say no, but I also have to have the ability to say no. I have to have the ability to decide. And of course, at the same time, when it comes to deciding, I invite you, please just be wise. <laughs> when it comes to actually making those decisions, be wise. What I mean by that is take steps, not leaps. Like even when it comes to like the idea of committing your life to one person, like getting married, Typically, that might look to people on the outside like a big leap. On the inside, it looks like dates. It looks like going on dates enough to realize I've taken enough steps, we've taken enough steps together that we're ready to take this next step. Again, often deciding isn't taking leaps. It's simply taking steps. Same thing when it comes to the Lord. He's inviting you. Here's the thing. God has placed a call on your life. I am convinced of this. God has a call on your life and he wants you at some point to, to do his, his big will like the, the, his big will for your whole life, to go out into the vineyard and give him your full yes. And yet, oftentimes our faith is not leaps, our faith is taken in steps. And so what is God's call in your life today? What is that small step, of that, what's that micro no you can, you, can, you can give? What's that mini yes that you can give? It's just taking those small steps today, like, okay, I'm just gonna say yes to God's invitation to prayer today. So. Be wise when deciding. Because then if, I, if I'm wise and I'm able to say no, I'm able to decide, then I'm growing in my ability and love is an ability. It involves, it always involves the freedom to say no. But then you need a new freedom. This is the crazy thing. Love requires the freedom to say no. And then you need a new freedom. And that's the freedom to say yes. It's the freedom to say yes regardless. We realize this, the, the power to love, the, the, uh, the, the, the freedom to love, the ability to love means that I first have the freedom and the power and the ability to say no, but then once I've decided I need a new kind of freedom, I need a new kind of freedom, the freedom, the power, the ability to simply do what I said I would do. That I'm here because you asked me to, and I'm here because I said I would. That, that's, that's it, that, that's love. That's, a, that's what it is to love the Father. I'm here, I'm doing this thing. Father, because you asked me to, and because I said I would. We realize it, right, right, let's go back to freedom. Sometimes in our culture, we define freedom as the ability to do whatever I want. And that is one definition of freedom. It's not a very good definition of freedom. In fact, the church offers what I think is a better definition of freedom. The freedom is not merely the power, the, the freedom to do whatever I want. 
Freedom is the power to do what I ought. Another way to say it, you could even say, make it personal. Freedom is the power. I have, actually have the ability to do what I said I would do, which is really scary because I think we know ourselves, right? We, we, well, we, all, have a, we all have a self-reputation. What I mean is we all know ourselves pretty well. And I think because of that, we doubt ourselves. Because I, I doubt myself, because why? Because I don't always do what I said I would do. And I know that about myself, so my self-reputation is not very good. But in order to have the ability, the power to love, I think step one is this, it's just really simple. Do what you said you would do. Just very, very simple, very, very simply. Just the, to develop the ability to love is simply to develop the ability to do what you said you would do. Another way to say it is we can start by just keeping the promises you make to yourself. Because in so many ways, that's what love is. Love is just keeping a promise. It's saying, I'm here because you asked me to and because I said I would, and then simply doing what you said you would do. That's how we love ourselves. That's how we love others. That's how we love God. Is I'm here because you asked me to and because I said I would. Which I know is... It's easier said than done. I mean, I, because to love regardless, to love regardless of changing seasons or changing moods is, it's one thing to hold on to, it's another thing to do. I, so we, when I was in high school, I think with my senior year in high school, this movie called, uh, when it's called When a Man Loves a Woman. It came out with Meg Ryan and Andy Garcia. And in the movie is this love story of the two of them. It's kind of a deeper love story where uh, Meg Ryan has uh, an alcohol problem. And so at one point they kind of split up. But at the end of the movie, they come back to, she's, she's in recovery and they come back together. And I remember going to this movie. Now, this woman I, I know, she had gone to see, she was older than me. She had gone to see it you know, a week before me. She said, what do you think? I said, oh my gosh, incredible, uh, just an incredible marriage, incredible love. I just was gushing about this because I was kind of a, kind of a sap, sappy kind of guy. Um, and, and just like how the, at the end, you know, they didn't give up on each other. And this woman looked at me and, and she said, Michael, that's just what you do. Now, at this point, this woman was married, I don't know, 25 years or something like this. You're like, Michael, that's just what you do. And that's true. That's, you know, when you decide, you make the promise to love regardless. Interestingly enough, maybe 20, 25 years later, this same woman was in almost an identical situation as the characters in this movie, where her husband of her lifetime had become an alcoholic. And I remember talking to her after she had dealt with this for a number of years. And she just, I remember, her just saying so candidly at one point, she was just like, I don't know how much longer I can do this. I remember just thinking, you're the same person who 20, 25 years ago said, that's just what you do. And that's true. It's just what you do. I'm here because you asked me to and because I said I would. I made a promise and love is keeping your promises. But then in the middle of it, she was living it and realized, this is tough. But this is what tough love is. This is what it is to have the ability to love. It is I'm here because you asked me to and because I said I would, I'm going to continue to love you. And we might be in this, you know, whoever's part of this, you might say, well, I want that. I want the ability. I want the power to love um, regardless. But there's no love. Like in my relationships with people, and my, maybe your spouse, maybe whoever, i just gone. It's gone. I, I don't know what to do. So it reminds me of this quote from St. John of the Cross. He, at one point, St. John of the Cross said, where there is no love, put love, and you'll find love. So where there is no love, so people say, like, I, there is no love in my life. Um, I, I don't have any love for this person or these people, whatever it is. And John of the Cross said, okay, where there is no love, put love, and you'll find love. And you might hear that and say, okay, Yoda, <laughs> thank you. What does that mean? Like, how do I actually do that? What are the practical situations for how, how in the world does a person do this? You know, it's fascinating. I was listening to a psychologist talk a bunch of years ago. Psychologist was talking, he, he's, a, he's a marriage and family therapist. He was describing how, he says, so many couples he sees that as they continue to, as these couples continue to grow and these families continue to grow, oftentimes he's noted that the love that parents have for their children outstrips the love that they have for each other. 
that even after years and years and years, the love parents have for their kids is just so much more abundant, so much more real, so much more powerful than the love that they have for each other. And, and he, he was investigating this and was wondering why. And he, he said, it wasn't because the children didn't make demands on their parents or because uh, the spouses were exceptionally difficult. He said, the reason why is because parents, they didn't consult their feelings when their children needed them. They just loved their children. They didn't, when, when the kids woke up in the middle of the night and they were sick, the parents didn't say, well, do I really feel like getting out of bed and taking care of you? They just did it. That when, when the kids needed help in adolescence, the parents didn't say, well, you know, you were cute when you were a kid, but you're not as cute anymore. And so, no, they just did it. They chose the actions of love regardless of how they felt. They didn't wait for their feelings to be there. They just loved. And also, they weren't bothered if the feelings weren't there. They just loved. And yet, when husbands and wives were loving each other, it seemed so often to the psychologist, he seemed so often that they were waiting for the feelings to be there. Or when the feelings weren't there, they were very, very bothered by this. But what if, what if in those marriages, they treated each other in some ways with the way they treated their children to say, I'm not going to wait for the feelings to be here. I'm just going to love. I'm not bothered if the feelings aren't here. I'm just going to love. I made a promise and I'm, I made a decision and I'm going to love regardless. I think that's an example of where there is no love, put love and you'll find love. And this is true for us, especially as we head out into the vineyard, especially as the, we're trying to say yes to God's will, because that's the whole point of the, the parable. That's the whole point of the gospel. It's the whole point of life is to do the Father's will. And I'm here, whatever it is you're doing, to be able to say, I'm here because he asked me to and because I said I would. In those moments though, of course, we know this tough love can feel an awful lot like duty. And I don't think we like that very much. Because we imagine, I, maybe, maybe not you, but I think a lot of times when it comes to following God and say, I'm here because he asked me to, because I said I would, I want to feel more, if this is a great call, I want to feel great. And yet, let, let's look at the greatest love of all time. In the second reading, St. Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 2, he describes, he says, though he was in the form of God, Jesus did not deem equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself. He poured himself out and took the form of a slave. He became obedient, obedient. Remember, remember what, what love is? How do we love God? By obeying his commands. He became obedient even until death, death on the cross. Imagine Jesus on the cross. I imagine that as Christ is being scourged, as he's carrying his cross, as being crucified, as he's gasping for breath on the cross, he's, his heart is not filled with this affection for everyone around him. Probably his heart was even filled with affection for the Father or this passion for doing God's will. But he would say, Father, I'm here because you asked me to. I'm doing this because you asked me to and because I said I would. And he did it with his whole heart. And that's the key. <laughs> There's a, when doing God's, this is the last thing. When it feels like duty, that I'm only here because I was asked to and because I said I would, it can feel empty and we can wait for our feelings. That's why I love St. Jose Maria Escrivá. He has this quote, St. Jose Maria said, he said, put your heart aside. <laughs> like those parents, other kids, like you don't, don't wait until your feelings are there. He says, put your heart aside. Duty comes first. Then he goes on to say, he says, but when fulfilling your duty, put your heart into it. <laughs> it helps. I love that. The idea of, when, when, put your heart aside. Duty comes first. But when fulfilling your duty, put your heart into it. Don't just go through the motions. It helps. And this is, this is something that you might find. I, this is something I found is really necessary for me. I find myself in a position where I've already said yes to something. And then now I have to go do the thing. So I'm here because I was asked to and because I said I would do this. And here's my temptation. My biggest temptation is this. I'm going to do it, but I'm not going to be happy about it. And maybe this, maybe this is you. And this is me on a regular basis. And I'm really trying to be, convert my heart about this because it's like, okay, this is my duty. And yes, I love God. I love people around me. So I'm going to do what I said I would do. But then my temptation is to bellyache. My temptation is to complain to everyone around me about I have to go do this thing now. And this might be you. We might do it so much that, that, that the people that we're with might start wishing that we had said no <laughs> instead of had said yes in our big graciousness and our willingness to love. But there's a difference in saying, I'm here because you asked me to and because I said I would and to do it resentfully because it's my duty. And the difference between I'm here because you asked me to and because I said I would 
I'm going to do it with joy. It's not because it feels good, but because this is God's will. This is God's will for me in this moment. And because of that, I can find joy in this moment. Because love is an ability. It is the freedom to say no. And it is the power to say yes regardless. And it's also the, the freedom, the ability, the, the, the inner power to take joy in the opportunity to love. To be able to say, I'm in the vineyard. I'm here and I'm doing this because he asked me to and because I said I would.